Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Washington, and we're at the America's Future Now conference. And joining us now is Scott Wallace. He is the vice chair of the Wallace Global Fund. He's also the grandson of Vice President Henry A. Wallace. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. So talk a bit about the fund, but more talk about your grandfather and the origins of this fund. Uh, Henry Wallace appeared at a very important time in, in U.S. history, and for those of our viewers that don't know, maybe just sort of fill us in on some of the facts, and then we can get into the significance of his life. The foundation, the Wallace Global Fund, was founded by Henry Wallace 60 years ago, uh, and it's guided by the vision that he had for America when he was vice president under, under Roosevelt in the third term and when he ran for president on a progressive third party ticket in 1948, which was sort of what the Institute for America's Future and the Campaign for America's Future are about now, which is defining the progressive populist left wing of American politics to influence the political debate between the Democrats and the Republicans, hopefully create some safe space off to the left. In the march of freedom of the past 150 years has been a long drawn out people's revolution. In this great revolution of the people there were the American Revolution of 1775, the French Revolution of 1792, the Latin American Revolutions of the Bolivarian era, the German Revolution of 1848, the Russian Revolution of 1918. Each spoke for the common man in terms of blood on the battlefield. Some went to excess, but the significant thing is that the people broke their way to the light. The people are on the march toward even fuller freedom than the most fortunate peoples of the earth have hitherto enjoyed. What he was trying to do in the 40s, uh, the battle has never stopped. Paul Wellstone picked it up, uh, people trying to figure out what is our role, uh, whether it's Harry Truman or Barack Obama, what is the role of the progressive movement in trying to pull the debate toward the real populist progressive left? Talk about some of the issues back in your grandfather's day. What, what differentiated him from Truman? Truman was selected by the party bosses in 1944 to replace Wallace because he was a machine politician. He came up through the machine in, in Missouri. Uh, they felt they could count on him to do what needed to be done for the the elites in the Democratic Party. There was a lot of concern about the post-war economy after World War II and the need to rebuild American business, which of course had been converted entirely to a war footing. So th there was a, a great desire to tend to the needs of American business after World War II. My grandfather had strong opinions about the direction of American foreign policy too, and that's what got him in trouble. <laughs> Secretary of Commerce Henry A. Wallace comes to the White House to hear from President Truman the direction U.S. foreign policy will take. Wallace's New York speech, which had a strong pro-Russian tone, made the secretary the center of a storm that swept between the White House and the State Department. After Roosevelt was re-elected with Truman as vice president, Wallace was offered this, uh, any cabinet job he wanted other than Secretary of State. What were the differences on foreign policy? He believed that uh, the Cold War, if we proceeded to have a, a war of words and an arms race with uh, Russia, that it would lead to the end of the world. It would lead to nuclear annihilation. There was no way to contain this atomic genie. Secretary of State Burns at the peace conferences bitterly resented Secretary Wallace's viewpoint, stated so soon after Burns' Stuttgart speech outlining a firm European policy. With President Truman's backing, Mr. Burns' program will be maintained, and with the help of his conference advisor, Senator Connolly and Senator Vandenberg, he hopes to clear the European peace model soon. A lively discussion among our top policymakers fosters the aims of democracy. So he felt, even though he was looked at then much the way Ralph Nader has been looked at these days, as someone who would cost the Democratic, the better Democratic candidate the election and turn it over to Dewey, uh, he just, he was driven. He, he felt that the fate of 
civilization depended just, on stopping Truman. Uh, just to get the, the history clear for people who don't know, uh, he was Roosevelt's vice president, but under pressure from the party leadership or bosses, Roosevelt switches to Truman. Right. So when Roosevelt dies, Truman's the candidate, and then Wallace goes and runs right. as a third party candidate. Roosevelt died three months after his, his fourth inauguration. So as the convention and the selection process was going on in the previous summer, he was already very weakened and he was easily influenced by the, the party bosses. So Truman came into office almost immediately after the election of Roosevelt to his fourth term in April of 1946. And uh, so Truman, uh, they had dropped the atomic bomb, uh, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and there was all this saber rattling with Russia. Uh, the Cold War was cranking up. My grandfather was very concerned about the direction that this was taking us, this confrontation with Russia. So even though he had been told he couldn't be Secretary of State, uh, he did. He became Secretary of Commerce. The nomination of Henry A. Wallace as Commerce Secretary brings this statement from Mr. Joel. The man who holds the vast responsibilities contained in the RFC should be one of proven and sound business experience. He should be able to attract men of sound judgment with business knowledge gained from experience in business. Then Mr. Wallace has a chance to testify for himself. For I tell you here and now, that if the RFC is left in the Commerce Department, I will use its powers in the interests of all the American people. He became Secretary of Commerce, but he proceeded to make speeches about foreign policy uh, because he said, well, there's this global economy and all that. It's all connected. So uh, he, he made a speech at, at Madison Square Garden in 1946 that uh, uh, Truman actually saw and said, it's fine, I love it, but then there was a big firestorm afterwards when everybody said, wait a minute, what Wallace just said is inconsistent with what Secretary of State Byrne has been saying. We are here tonight because we want peace. The world cries out, not for an American crusade in the name of hatred and fear of communism, but for a world crusade in the name of the brotherhood of man. In the name of crisis, facts are withheld. Time is denied. Hysteria is whipped up. The Congress is asked to rush through a momentous decision, as if great armies were already on the march. I hear no armies marching. I hear a world crying out for peace. The truth is that the president and his Republican backers are less concerned with the need of the Greek people for food than with the need of the American Navy for oil. The plan to contain communism is really secondary to the push for oil. For every glamorous admiral who boasts it's nobody's damn business where we go, there are ten drab but practical procurement officers to add, and we'll get there with the oil of the Middle East. If we took the matter to the United Nations and the Russians exercised their veto, the moral burden would be on them. When we act independently outside the framework of the United Nations, the moral burden is on us. Because Burns ramping up the Cold War rhetoric. Right. And Burns went and said, yeah, either Henry goes or I go. And said, so, okay, well, I'll get rid of him. So he got rid of him, and uh, so he goes out, and now he's on a crusade to save the world. He became editor of the New Republic. Um, he was asked to write an article for the New York Times about foreign policy and what, what's going on in America. Uh, and the article that he wrote was called The American Fascist. He wrote about the tendency in America for corporations and government to become fused and the corrupting influence of corporate money and corporate power 
in politics and how it could divert attention from the needs of what he called the common man. was also a big New Dealer, so that was another, Truman starts moving toward more corporatist type of economics. Talk a little bit about that. That was the, the struggle for his most famous speech as Vice President was about the need to, to uh, Henry Luce, the publisher of Time Magazine, had his most famous speech was, this is going to be the American century, the century that comes after the Cold War. America and Britain shall rule the world, because we're the greatest country on earth. And Wallace said, hold on, hold on. This shall not be the American century. How arrogant. We have no more right to rule the world than do the Nazis. How's that for a smackdown? Uh, he said, this shall be and must be the century of the common man. Some have spoken of the American century. I say that the century on which we are entering, the century which will come out of this war, can be and must be the century of the common man. If we really believe we are fighting for a people's peace, all the rest becomes easy. This shall be and must be the century of the common man. And he, so he, he was presaging this debate after Truman took over between the huge corporate interests that wanted to rebuild American industry legitimately after World War II when all industry had converted to war production. Uh, and saying we have to be so careful to separate business from government. Well, in the next segment of our interview, because we do these in sort of eight, nine, ten minute segments, uh, let's talk about today's Democratic Party. Because when President Obama was asked during the election campaign, where do you position your foreign policy in terms of American history and tradition? He said, I start with Truman. I'm in, the, I'm in the tradition of American pragmatic foreign policy and I start my vision of the world with Truman. So my question in the next segment of our interview is, is there any of Wallace left in the Democratic Party? Please join us for the next segment of our interview on The Real News Network. Strong in the strength of the Lord, we who fight in the people's cause will never stop until that cause is won.